Hang on. <coughs> Sounds like we got a little liquid sunshine coming down outside. It's all right. We are safe and dry in here. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to uh, address this good audience this morning. Thank you, Robert, for those good songs. I agree that Hear Me When I Call is a beautiful song and a beautiful sentiment. About the new clicker this morning. Matthew 27, verses 11 to 16. I have entitled the lesson this morning, The Curious Case of Barabbas. This is an interesting situation and an interesting character, the actual man Barabbas. And what we know of him is given to us in the four Gospels. Each of the four Gospels, he's not omitted from any of them when we read about this story of Jesus of Nazareth as he stands before Pontius Pilate in one of the many uh, mock trial incidents that take place as he is being delivered up to be crucified. Matthew 27, Mark chapter 15, Luke 23, and John 18 are where we find this account of Jesus before Pilate and where the person of Barabbas is introduced to us. We will see, as we look at this, that he is a passive character in all of this, to the best of our knowledge and what the scripture gives us. We don't ever hear him speak, uh, but we do learn a lot about him, and I believe he is placed there for a reason, and I think there are many lessons that we can learn from his inclusion in the story of Jesus before Pilate and the overall story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 18, we will refer mostly to Matthew 27. That was read for us in uh, the Bible study hour in our devotional this morning, so we will not go through and read that whole section again. But if we could sort of summarize, uh, looking through Matthew chapter 27, we see that toward the end of this process of Jesus being falsely tried, when morning came, chief priests and elders brought him to Pontius Pilate. Um, And verse 11 says he stood before the governor. This is where Pilate asks Jesus, saying, are you the king of the Jews? For this this, this was the accusation that the chief priests and elders, the Jews, had brought against Jesus, that he said he was the king of the Jews. Jesus' response is, it is as you say. Pilate asks him, do you not hear the many things they testify against you? Now these Jews were testifying against Jesus. They were saying things about him that were not true. They were accusing him of things that he did not do. And Pilate, wants, it, it seems, wants Jesus to stand up and answer these charges. Well, there's no need for him to do that, for they were false charges. And he remains silent through the process. So, verse 15 says, Now at the feast the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. Now this would be the feast of the Passover. This was the time when Jesus was in Jerusalem. He had come back to Jerusalem for the Passover, prophesied that he would be uh, delivered up, and this was the time that that was done. If we were to take time to go back and think of the Passover and its implications, the, the, the Paschal Lamb and its Uh, saving so many of the children of Israel and how that equates to Jesus Christ, the the Lamb of God, there would certainly be rich lessons there. But for time's sake this morning, we'll stick to this uh, discussion of the character of Barabbas. So it it was the custom to release to the Jews one of the prisoners that they had uh, as a show of good faith. Well, Barabbas and Jesus are basically offered up together. Pilate, looking for a way out of this situation, wants to offer the the Jews a choice. He thought that they would choose to have Jesus released and that Barabbas would be uh, sentenced to what he deserved. Verse 15 calls him a notorious prisoner. Verse 17, it says, Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called Christ. But then he goes on to say he knew that they had handed him over for for envy. So this is the situation that 
we see has developed. We have Pontius Pilate in a situation of trying to make a decision. We have Jesus standing before him, actually the one who is in control of everything that's going on. We have the Jews who are calling for his crucifixion, and we have Barabbas, this passive character. So let's look more closely at the principal entities who are involved here. First of all, Jesus. Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, the perfect Son of the living God, who 50 days later would be described uh, by Peter in Acts 2, verses 22 to 23, uh, this way. He says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you, he's talking to some of the same people perhaps that were in this, uh, watching this trial, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. And of course, this is after the fact of the trial, crucifixion, resurrection, uh, and then ascension of Jesus. Um, Peter goes on to say, whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So Peter's description after the fact, again, some 50 days later at Pentecost, uh, it tells the Jews that Jesus was attested by God. He, did, he was attested by God, proven by God, by miracles, signs, and wonders that these people witnessed, but they still were determined to have him put to death. And that's what they are calling upon uh, Pilate to do. So this is Jesus, uh, the, one of the principal entities in this situation. Then we have Pontius Pilate, who at this time was the Roman governor of this province of Judea where Jerusalem lay. And his gu gubernatorial residence, if you will, was here in this main city of Jerusalem, and this is where he sat in judgment, and this is where Jesus was brought to him uh, a second time during this process for him to make a decision uh, as to whether or not he would give in to what the Jews wanted. Pilate was a politician, and it's a shame that you can't say that without a negative connotation, but particularly in this day and time, uh, politicians in the Roman government, there was a lot of negative, there was a lot of corruption, uh, there was a negative connotation that politicians were, uh, their main job was to survive and hold their office, and this was certainly an underlying motivation of Pilate. This, the verses that we have referred to here say that Pilate knew the Jews' motivation was envy. He knew that. He knew that uh, they were envious of Jesus, and he could see that what was going on here was not just. This is Pilate who offered to release Jesus, but instead released Barabbas, whose wife referred to Jesus as a just man. If you read all of these accounts, you see, uh, and even the one here in, in Matthew, that his wife says that she had been troubled by many things because of him in a dream and that she knew that Jesus was a just man. She sent a note to him while this was going on saying, don't have anything to do uh, with, with, this, uh, with this punishment of Jesus. He's a just man. And then he literally washes his hands of the matter, makes a great show of uh, his opposition to what's going on, and then turns around and sentences Jesus to death. And he did this... Mark's count says to please the crowd. So this is Pontius Pilate. Uh, if you, and I'll go through these quickly. If you go through all of these, all the Gospels and you look, there are actually seven attempts by Pilate to not sentence Jesus to death. First, he sends him back to Herod Antipas. He, he proclaims a verdict of innocence on Jesus. He offers a lighter punishment. He proposes the main uh, instance of our story today. He proposes to release Jesus and have Barabbas sentenced to what he deserves. He insisted on his innocence a second time and asked the question, what evil has he done? He suggested that the Jews just take him and deal with him on their own. 
And then after all of this, he still sought to release him. Uh, but when his political loyalty is questioned, he relents and gives the Jews what they want. So principal entity number two in this situation. Thirdly, we have the, the Jews, the chief priests, the elders, and let's not forget the all-important multitude. These were people were led by those who had been plotting the murder of Jesus for quite some time. A great example of this, if you would, turn to John chapter 11. Perhaps to, to me, the one that is a very stark example of the, the corruption and the underlying evil that was there. Pilate says it was envy, or the Bible said that he knew it was envy. This is how far-reaching that envy took the, was and took the Jews in their treatment of Jesus. John 11, of course, we remember, is, is the great story of the resurrection of Lazarus, a man who had been in the tomb, the story tells us, for four days. Jesus, great friend. Jesus makes his way there. We have the, the, the famous uh, verse. I, 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 I'm uh, sorry that it's famous sometimes for being the shortest verse, but one of the most powerful verses in the Bible, Jesus wept. He goes there and he weeps over his friend Lazarus. He weeps over the sorrow that uh, Mary and Martha are feeling because of the death of their brother. But then he says with three words, Lazarus come forth. Uh, or excuse me, he uh, activates with three words, Lazarus come forth, the death of this man that's been in the tomb for four days. And there were people there watching that. In John chapter 11, verse 45, it says, The many of the Jews had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus uh, did, and they believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them things Jesus did. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take both our place and our nation. So they had figured out, or they thought they had figured out, uh, that, that Jesus, if, if, if he's allowed to continue to do these things, and they're not questioning whether or not the things that he did were true. They just saw him raise a man from the dead. They figured out if, if they allow him to keep doing these things, people are going to begin to follow him instead of them. Their place and their nation is going to be taken away. They coveted those high positions and the, the ease and comfort that it brought them. Caiaphas Verse 49, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You don't know anything. He said, listen, he said, you don't know the half of it. Verse 50 says, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one should die for all the people and not the whole nation should perish. Caiaphas didn't know the accuracy of his words. He didn't, of course, he was thinking politically. Of course, Jesus, we know, would die for all but not so that the nation of Israel could survive, but so that the, the, the church of Jesus Christ could be established. Verse 51, Now this he did not say to, on his own authority, but being a high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also he would gather together one of the children of God who were scattered abroad. This is the, the key verse, verse 53 in John chapter 11, uh, after seeing the power of Jesus in resurrecting Lazarus, it says, Then, from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Now, these same people that were behind this meeting and this plot are the ones that we find here in the case of uh, Jesus before Pontius Pilate. The chief priests and the elders, again, let's not forget the multitude, but the multitude were being led by these chief priests and elders, these high-ranking Jewish official, officials. And then, finally, Barabbas, this passive character that we have mentioned. Interesting to note, and names are often very, very important in the Bible. The name Barabbas, when you break it down, the word bar means son or son of. The word Abba means father. And when you put those together, of course, you have the son of the father. 
We also see that Barabbas, as we've mentioned before, was a notorious criminal. Matthew chapter 27, go back to that, verse 16, at, the time, at that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. He was known as a rebel. Mark's account in chapter 15, verse 7, describes him as a rebel and a murderer. Mark 15, 7 says, And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. We don't know a lot about this rebellion. We can only assume that in that day and time, in that political climate in uh, Judea, which was under Roman rule, that the rebellion would have been against the Romans. So here you have a man who's committed murder in a rebellion, sitting in a Roman prison, and being offered, uh, Jesus being offered to die, yet they want to choose him uh, to be released. He's also called a robber very simply in John's account. John 18, 40 says Barabbas was a robber. And then finally, he was, he was a convicted person. He was convicted of all of these things. There's no indication in the information that we have from Scripture that there was any question as to whether or not Barabbas had committed all of these heinous things of which he is uh, uh, accused. In fact, the fact that the Bible says he was a robber, says he committed murder, says he was a rebel, uh, tells us that those things were true. He had done them, and he was deserving of the punishment uh, of death by their laws. So those are the principal entities in this situation. When I kind of had this idea, and it was from one of our Wednesday night summer series, I don't remember exactly who it was, but Barabbas was brought up in the discussion uh, and made me think, what lessons can we find from this discussion of this character Barabbas uh, and how the part he plays in the trial of Jesus. I think of all of these people and persons and entities in this, how does that reflect upon me as a Christian? And I have to ask the question, who am I? And of course, if I look at Jesus, I don't represent Jesus. Jesus doesn't represent me, not even close. Jesus, the perfect son of God, in my humble state as a, a sinful human being, I, I am not represented by Jesus here. He had done nothing wrong. Jesus, uh, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2, verse 22. Thankfully, he's there on my behalf, but I cannot compare myself to him. What about Pilate? My answer here is perhaps sometimes and in some ways I can see some of my self and by my pre-perfected self in the person of Pilate. Thankfully, the fact that after the fact Jesus we know was there on our behalf that we can be perfected through him, we, we can be different. We can be a new person, a new, a new creature. But perhaps when I'm selfish, thinking of my own interests, perhaps when I'm irresponsible, perhaps when I'm arrogant, maybe I'm a little like Pilate in this situation. What about the Jews? Again, maybe sometimes in some ways. Maybe when I'm intellectually dishonest, when I see, like the Jews did, the providential evidence of God's work in my own life and in the lives of others, when I read his word and I find some way to rationalize my way out of knowing and believing and following it and obeying it, I am like the Jews in this case. They had seen the works of, of, of Christ. They saw miracles take place. And they chose to use those as a politically expedient way to murder the man uh, who was performing them. Even though... They knew that those things could only have come from God. So perhaps sometimes I'm a little bit like the Jews. But I believe that logic demands that we consider Barabbas as a representative of all who have fallen short of the glory of God by committing sin. I think it's possible that his 
passive inclusion in this is there to represent us all and that we should consider whether or not there are lessons to be learned from that. So in the balance of the time that we have this morning, let's look at Barabbas and the lessons that we can glean from him. Again, we revisit all of these things. We saw that he was mentioned as a notorious criminal, a rebel, a murderer, a robber, a person who was convicted of his crimes. And Jesus died in his place, but that his fate was decided by others. Again, his passive inclusion in this situation. So let's take these one by one and see how they compare to us in the time that we have left this morning. So he was a notorious criminal. Well, I'm a notorious sinner. And it may not be, it is certainly not the case that everyone in this, within the sound of my voice today who knows me personally is aware of all of the sin that I've committed in my life. There's no way that you could. But you know what? God is aware of all of the sin that I've committed in my life, just as he is aware of all of the sin committed by every person. Jeremiah 16, verse 17 says, in the words of God, through the prophet, my eyes are on all their ways. They're not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity hidden from my eyes. Psalm 69, verse 5 says, O God, you know my foolishness. And my sins are not hidden from you. Psalm 139 verse 1 and 2 says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. I may not be a notorious sinner to the world at large, but before the blood of Christ cleansed me from those things, in the eyes of God, I, I am a notorious sinner. But he gave us his word and gives us the opportunity to understand it and to react to it. Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13, a very familiar passage says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his, God's, sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. And this is the important part. To him to whom we are to give an account. So God has given us his word. He's given us the opportunity to react to it, to understand it, to obey it. And we will have to give an account of our treatment of that word. God knows that I'm a sinner. Just like the world knew that Barabbas was a notorious criminal. Secondly, Barabbas was a rebel. For this, I'd like for us to turn back to uh, the book of 1 Samuel and look at the act of rebellion and how God looks at it when he sees it in us. Sin is rebellion. That is, by definition, what it is when we go against the word of God. And in this particular instance, we have the children of Israel who, what did they do? They, they requested, they demanded of God to give them a king. They, God gave them Saul. He was anointed by Samuel to be king, and through the course of his reign, uh, he did some good things, but he also ended up going the wrong direction. Perhaps uh, that old saying that absolute power corrupts absolutely took its toll on Saul. And in one case, in, verse, in chapter 15, God gives his word, his specific instruction for Saul to go out against the uh, uh, Amalekites and to utterly destroy them. Verse 2 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. There's no question as to what God wants done. But if you drop down to verse 9, it says, Saul and the people spared Agag, that was their king, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. God said utterly destroy them. 
Saul, his representative to his own people, said that he was unwilling to do that. That is rebellion. God's reaction to that in verse 11 says, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as a king, for he has turned back from following me. Skip down to verse 22. Samuel, this is Samuel talking to and explaining the f- Saul's sa- fate to him. Has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. And the key point here when we're looking at the idea of rebelliousness. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. When we don't do what God's word tells us to do, or we do things that it tells us not to do, we are rebelling against God. That is the very nature of sin, is to be uh, in rebellion to God. Barabbas was a rebel, and when I sin, I find myself in rebellion as well. Barabbas was called a murderer. Well, I'm certain that none of us in this audience have committed murder. But it is a truth that my sin caused the death of Christ. Isaiah 53, verse 5, said he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. We can substitute the word my for the word our there. Jesus, the Christ, was wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my iniquities. It's my fault, just as much as anyone else's, that he had to go to the cross. I may not be a murderer, but I have responsibility in the death of the Son of God. John 18 called him a a robber, and as an illustration of this point, I thought of this concept of stolen valor. Some of you may have heard of that. Stolen valor is when a person proclaims to have served or accomplished something in a military sense, perhaps in, uh, in, in a, 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 a situation of battle during a war, uh, perhaps won an honor or done something that they uh, would like to be honored for, except the problem is they haven't done it. They are trying to get people to believe something about them that is not true. This had become such a problem that in 2005, President George W. Bush, during his administration, a a law was signed that made it a federal crime to falsely represent oneself as having received military decoration or medal. And if convicted, defendants might have been imprisoned for up to six months. If someone claimed to have done something and received a Medal of Honor and had not, uh, the punishment could be imprisonment up to a year. Unfortunately, this law was struck down in 2012. The Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional as an abridgment of the freedom of speech under the First Amendment. But a group and a website still exist to expose these fraudulent people who would go out and say, I was a Navy SEAL, or I was uh, a a commander uh, of of a military uh, force. I saved someone's life. I won this medal uh, so that they could claim certain benefits and be respected by people for things that they didn't deserve. That's stolen valor. When we claim to be righteous, and we're not, when we are hypocritical in our life and in our service to God, we're stealing the valor that Jesus died for. I can sometimes be a robber. I can be like Barabbas if I try to steal that righteousness. Barabbas was convicted. I have been convicted of sin. Romans 3.23 says it, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That word, A-L-L, covers it, doesn't it? It doesn't leave anybody out. Once I am of an accountable age, know the difference between right and wrong, and choose wrong, rebel against God, 
I'm convicted of sin. And Jesus literally, and this is the, the idea that has to kind of grip you when you think about Barabbas. There is, a, there is a person who lived on this earth that in a physical sense, Jesus died in his place. And his name was Barabbas. There was a choice to be made because of the weakness of Pilate. There was a choice to be made between releasing the Son of God who had committed no sin or a notorious criminal who was a robber and a murderer and a rebel, Barabbas. One of them gets to go free. And the Jews said, give us Barabbas. Jesus instead went and died on the cross. Jesus died in his place, but Jesus also died in my place. But then the contrasting and final point when we think about Barabbas is that Barabbas, again, was a passive inclusion and character in this story. His fate was decided by others. He was, if you will, a a kind of a witless pawn in the Jews' desire to have Jesus crucified. But me, in contrast, and all of us here in contrast, we get to make a decision. Because Jesus was willing to go to that cross and die on our behalf, we have the opportunity to make a choice. We can take advantage of that death and be grateful for it and live for him. As Romans 6 tells us, the first part of that chapter says, he died for us, we should live for him. We have a choice. It it may be this morning that you're here and you've never taken advantage of that great opportunity to make a choice. Well, don't let your fate be decided by the lack of choice. Don't, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. Choose obedience. Choose to know that this was the Son of God. To believe all that the Bible says about him. To know that sin is what sent him to the cross and be willing to turn away from it. Be willing to stand up and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and be buried in a watery grave of baptism, raised up to walk in newness of life, and live for him from that point forward. Make that your choice. Maybe some of us here this morning made that choice at some point in our lives, and have not lived in a way that shows the gratitude for what Jesus did. We don't know, and it's interesting, we don't know anything about what happened to Barabbas after this. We could, we could only hope that once he found out that he was being released and that a just man died in his place, we can only hope that that had some kind of positive influence on his life, but we don't know. But we do know what our choice can be. Our choice can be to remember that each and every day, take up our cross and follow him. I am a son of the father. Barabbas was son of a father. I am a son of the father. And I have been sinful and rebellious. The blood of Jesus Christ, uh, I have part in that. But thankfully, the fact that he died makes it possible for me to have all of those things taken away and give me the possibility of the hope of heaven. If you would like to take advantage of that hope as well this morning, please come as we stand and sing.